Fantastic. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Shagan Olusanya. I am an intensive care registrar working in Bart Health and a member of the Fusic Committee. And it is my absolute delight and pleasure to welcome you to this webinar this evening. Um, thank you so much for, for spending, choosing to spend your Thursday evening with myself and Johnny Aaron. Um, I will give Johnny a chance to introduce himself in just a second, but just before I do so, um, this is interactive. We're going to have a chance to have ask lots of questions. You'll be able to ask questions live as we discuss cases. But if you're going to ask questions, please could I implore that if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little icon that says Q&A. And if you put your questions in Q&A rather than in the chat icon, that would be fantastic because Johnny and I will be tracking your questions the whole time and we'll do our best to answer them all. And on that note, I shall introduce you all to my very, very dear friend and also co-member of the Fusic Committee, Johnny Aaron. Uh, hi there. Yeah, uh, uh, my name's John Aaron. Um, I work at St. George's as a consultant and I'm an enthusiast for all things ultrasound and echo. I'll um, start with a basic uh, heart ultrasound case um, and I'm just going to share my screen. And like I say, please put your questions um, in the Q&A section and if possible, just turn up your mics um, and uh, so you're not disturbing the talk. So one second. Uh, all right, good. Uh, is is that visible to everyone out there? Well, I can see your screen just fine, Johnny, so I'm presuming that everybody else can. Great. Okay, uh, so I will start with a basic case, um, and this is based really on the skills that you acquire doing a FICE accreditation. Now, if you ask me, doing a FICE accreditation is not just about going to a course, getting the numbers, getting the sign off. This is about learning something applicable to your clinical practice that will transform the way you practice. And I hope this case will, this case and the ones we discussed today will infuse you that it's not just a qualification, it's something that actually will make you a better doctor um, because it adds to your already very substantial knowledge base. So uh, think about you managing this patient. Um, so it's a 42 year old male who's normally fit and healthy, had an insect bite while running in the park two days ago and his legs got more red and more swollen. And eventually he rocks up to um, the, your emergency department and uh, to the shock of everyone, he looks absolutely awful. So end of better gram is uh, kind of like hair raising. His blood pressure is 70 over 40, his heart rate's 110, um, his lactate is eight on a gas. His capillary refill time is uh, very, very short. Um, so peripherally, it's less than one second. So that's 98% on air, but he's breathing hard with a respiratory rate of 45 per minute. And he's very agitated and a little bit confused. So uh, as with uh, all good um, uh, initial managements. He gets four liters of crystalloid stat in resus. He gets some augmenting. That's interesting. He gets augmenting. Now that's clearly meant to say augmenting, um, but I mean, you know, you get buy one, get one free. Who knows what he would like augmenting. Um, and he also gets some gent after the appropriate blood cultures. However, nothing changes. He remains almost exactly as he was before. And of course he gets referred to the intensive care unit. Now, uh, Luckily, the intensive care doctor is able to do an echo, which is you. And this is the echo that you um, uh, perform. Now, I'm not going to show you anything that is beyond the scope of FICE. So for those of you learning FICE, I'll talk you through the image. This is a parasternal long axis view. Um, here you have um, the right ventricle, uh, the septum, the left ventricle, the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and the left atrium. Um, and uh, overall, um, I would hope that you'd agree that this is a pretty hyperdynamic looking heart. So try and slow the image down in your head and look at how the septum and the inferior lateral wall come together during systole. Okay, and the cavity is almost completely obliterated. So that implies one of or two, one of two, or possibly both um, pathophysiological mechanisms. Either that his preload is low or that his afterload is low, okay? So if he had a, an isolated afterload problem, then the left ventricle with minimum amount of force will be able to empty with ease and therefore completely empty, which is what the two walls coming together is. If there was a preload problem, the end diastolic area, the end diastolic volume would be low as well. And to cope with that, the heart would also empty the cavity completely. So on the whole, a preload problem would have a small heart when full, 
and an, a completely obliterated cavity during systole. And a pure afterload problem would have a relatively full heart when filling and an empty heart um, during systole. Um, but the reality is both pathologies exist. So Johnny, can I interrupt you there for a moment? Hmm. So I'm a young vice pad one, and I'm like, oh, trying to figure out how I can identify this um, hyperdynamic heart. Hmm. Um, what happens if I stick my finger right in the middle of the screen in between the cavities? Does that help in any way? So there's lots of different, um, there's lots of different ways to try and identify a hyperdynamic heart. Now, if you were to look at this image, for instance, and if you were to pause it when it's at, the, when it's at its fullest, and pause it when it's at its emptiest and trace those areas. It almost doesn't matter what the area is when it's at its fullest because there is no cavity when it's at, at its emptiest. So mm. automatically the ejection fraction is 100%, which is mm. a hyperdynamic heart by definition. So you can eyeball these things very effectively. And we know that actually that eyeballing in the right hands with the right training is as good as objective measurements in this kind of situation. So in this case here, there is no cavity at the end of systole, which means by definition, by the laws of mathematics, um, the ejection fraction is 100%, which is a hyperdynamic situation. Now, wow. trying to identify whether it is a preload problem or an afterload problem um, is actually much more challenging uh, and beyond the scope of FICE and probably beyond the, beyond the scope in many ways of more advanced echoing um, and likely, in all likelihood, to be a combination of both, okay? So um, the treatments are are similar-ish and we'll talk about those in a minute. So here's a parastole short axis uh, and again you can see the right ventricle is barely visible uh, at this mid pillory level and you'd normally see a little bit of a crescent a crescent shaped right ventricle and the cavity is obliterating during systole. Um, yep. Johnny, that's another thing. So you know again I'm the ICU doctor, I'm looking after this patient I've this, I've basically got somebody who's really sick and I've poured liters and liters of crystalloid into them and they haven't got any better. Yep. Um, would I also be thinking about other diagnoses that I'd be looking for in my FI scan? And is it worth commenting on things that aren't there too? So, yeah, um, good point. So uh, I'll park that for a minute um, just because uh, I, the differential is important, but I want the audience to think about the differential and then think about their management and what they can practically do in the ED uh, and in their ITU. So um, pause that and we'll talk about it in a sec. So um, apical four chamber, again, um, no new information, um, although uh, Shagan's talked about the differentials, um, what, that could what, what, what that could be. Um, but again, the left ventricle is a slither and during systole, it's basically the walls touch each other, which is not a normal situation. Um, and, you know, it's looking bouncy, it's looking, it's looking like it's working quite hard. Um, and in terms of differentials, there's no pericardial effusion and the right ventricle even though the right ventricle in this image looks the same size as the left ventricle, this is a pretty critically hypovolemic, hyperdynamic state. And therefore, when you compare the sizes of these two chambers, you've got to take into account that actually if one chamber is really small because of another pathology, it doesn't make sense to compare the other chamber against a really abnormally small chamber. So you've got to then think about what's the absolute values, um, absolute sizes of these chambers. Uh, and again, now this is a uh, subcostal view looking at the IVC because the four chamber view is boring. It doesn't add anything new in this case. And as you can see, the IVC is a slither. Yeah, tiny, tiny IVC, um, which there are lots of caveats to look, using your IVC to judge severe hypovolemia. But in this case, it suggests severe hypovolemia in, its, in and itself. And we have um, evidence um, um, from other sources as well. The rest of the echo, the end diastolic area of the left ventricle is small, the end systolic area of the left ventricle is small, there's tachycardic and hyperdynamic appearance of the heart, there's no other differentials within the scope of FICE that could be causing this, and you're a doctor, so you know the patient is is got a low capillary refill time, a high lactate, the history is typical, he's young, so you've ruled in your initial clinical diagnosis, which is severe septic shock, a combination of preload deficiency and a low afterload. So your echo has reinforced that diagnosis. All your ducks line up, it's all good, okay? So the next question is, and this is where I've tried to use technology, can you get your phones out, turn your...
Johnny, looks like you're frozen for the moment. It might be worth disconnecting and reconnecting. Sorry about that, everyone. The freeze froze for a moment. We're just going to get Johnny back for a moment. Ah, sorry about that. It looks like Johnny screened because his computer just had a moment of um, being very upset and has frozen for and has frozen. So he'll be rejoining us in a moment. In the meantime, I'm happy to take any questions about the case. And just as he was getting to the really, really good bit as well, unfortunately. So what he has lined up for you is um, uh, he was actually going to use a Google Forms to get you to get you to actually be part of the case and vote as to what treatment you're going to apply to this patient who in whom we've got decent evidence of hypovolemia. So I'll give Johnny maybe a minute or so to see if he can rejoin. Um, in the meantime, let's have a look at your question so far. Um, nothing is yet. And if Johnny takes too long, I have got a case myself that I'm more than happy to present, and I'll move on to presenting that. And yes, as people have mentioned, just as he was talking about the tech, it's just, what can we say? It's just sod's law, isn't it? Okay, while well, Johnny's still reconnecting, what I will probably do, in which case I will just start off with my case for the moment. So I have a slightly more complicated case um, where I was going to discuss the role of ultrasound. And this is kind of showing you what Fusic can do for now and Fusic can do in future. Um, so I was going to discuss the role of ultrasound in an ECMO patient. So I'm going to start off by sharing my screen. And there you go. So everybody should be able to see my screen now. So I'm going to present a really interesting case that came to us in Bart's Hospital um, that was um, that involved multi-organ ultrasound to manage the patient. Um, so just to start with, I've got a few conflicts of interest, the most important one of which being that I'm on the FUSIC committee. So therefore, I'm going to be quite biased in favor of using point of care ultrasound to manage a patient. Um, so this story starts very similarly to the way lots of other stories that we've had um, all for the last three months have started. So this is a 57 year old gentleman who presented to um, one of our local DGHs in Barch Trust um, after one week of fever, shortness of breath and cough. Um, he had a COVID-19 positive swab. Um, and so he was initially, whilst initially managed on the shop floor with oxygen, he was rapidly transferred and moved up to the ICU due to increasing oxygen requirements. Um, and this is presenting chest x-ray. So for those of you who've been looking after COVID-19 positive patients, you can recognize the bilateral um, peripheral infiltrates and um, very classical of COVID-19 disease. So he was initially managed um, according to what are now national guidelines with, um, with continuous positive airway pressure and self-proning. Um, and despite this, he maintained, he remained quite hypoxic on quite high levels of oxygen, 80 to 90 percent. He was quite a well-read gentleman and had been reading at the time the widespread report of increased mortality with um, being COVID-19 positive and being um, mechanically ventilated. So he was very reluctant to be invasively ventilated. So the team made a decision in accordance with his wishes to manage him with um, aggressive diuresis and he was made not for resuscitation interestingly enough and and that was something that he agreed with. Unfortunately by day five he became increasingly hypercapnic and drowsy. He finally agreed to being intubated and unfortunately became very unwell around the time of intubation. He became peri-arrest, um, had a brief PA arrest um, actually and after being intubated was severely hypoxic and was instantaneously prone and remained on 100% oxygen with SATs of 80 to 90%. Um, he was referred for, um, he hit all the criteria for ECMO with 
um, just about a borderline RESP score. So for those of you who've been referring people for ECMO, that, um, there's this particular score um, called the RESP score that is required to be less than, uh, required to be more than three. And if it's less than three, um, it's, they're not seen to be a good candidate for ECMO. And his was just about three, if I remember. Um, nonetheless, we reviewed him and reviewed the case and we thought that he would be a good candidate for ECMO. So at Bart's, we have a retrieval service. And so we moved out to retrieve him on mobile ECMO. This was his chest X-ray um, just after he was intubated. You can now see he's got a he's got a um, ET tube here. He's got a central line in. He's now got quite significant bilateral opacities, much worse than his initial presenting X-ray. And this was the X-ray around the time that we um, that um, around the time when we went to retrieve him. Just a little bit about how we retrieve people in BART on ECMO. So we normally do um, biofemoral cannulation, and um, our ECMO guidance, uh, it's all guided with ultrasound at the bedside and we actually manipulate the guide wires and cannulas at the bedside using, um, using either echocardiography or in some cases, if we can get fluoroscopy, we do. However, in um, COVID-19 times, it was probably much easier and much safer from an infection control point of view to use, um, um, to, to perform at the bedside of TTE, which is exactly what we did. Um, ultrasound guidance for cannula placements is actually really, really important. So um, this is just a nice view of um, basically femoral, um, femoral artery, femoral vein. And the main things that you're looking for is you want a nice unobstructed vein and you want a diameter of at least one centimeter, um, mainly because that the diameter will determine the cannula that you put in. And so, um, so the, the ECMO cannula all come in French gauge sizes and the French gauge size is basically the diameter in millimeters multiplied by three. So we mostly put in, you know, we put in 25 French drainage and, you know, 23 French returns. So a centimeter of diameter will give you more than enough room to put in, to put in a drainage and return Canada without obstructing the vein. The good thing about most ECMO patients is, or most people with severe respiratory failure, is they develop a degree of pulmonary hypertension. And that allows people, and um, that usually means that they get a degree of right ventricular dilatation and some downstream pressure, which makes their veins nice and dilated and makes them quite easy to candidate. Um, so we candidated him and successfully brought him back to BART, at which point one of the things that we do as, a, as our baseline, um, so once people are put on VV ECMO, their um, respiratory function is changed quite significantly and we're able to, um, we're able to manage these patients, um, mainly using the ECMO for oxygenation and CO2 clearance, and we're able to switch to then lung protective ventilation and minimize their ventilation. But one of the things that you also want to do at the same time is have a base, baseline view, baseline imaging of their lungs. Some people do this with CT. At BART, we did this with lung ultrasound. And so these are images from initial lung ultrasound. And so up here, you can, see, you can see a rolling video. So this is actually the right upper quadrant. And right here, you can see that this is, so these dark shadows here are ribs. Here is the plural line. You can see that this plural line is bright white, but it's also irregular. And there's lots of white beams just coming off this plural line. And these are known as B lines people who are doing their fusic lung accreditation. Um, these B lines are just a sign of increased um, extravascular lung water. And these B lines have been a hallmark of people with COVID-19 disease ever since the disease started. And so he has, just in his right upper quadrant, he's got quite a lot of COVID-19 disease. But Shigan, can I ask, are B lines found in any other disease processes? Yes, they are. A very, very good point to raise, Johnny. So um, B lines just show increased extravascular lung water. And so the original person who described um, um, a lot of the lung ultrasound findings that we have is a, an intensivist, French intensivist called Daniel Lichtenstein. And in his initial case series, 65 to 70% of the people who had B lines in ICU had cardiogenic pulmonary edema. However, it also means that 35% of people had other diagnoses. And so non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema will give you B lines. So all forms of ARDS do it. Um, pulmonary fibrosis will give you B lines. Um, thing, and, and then strange things like, um, um, so um, lung um, 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 oncological infiltrates can give you B lines. Um, um, aspiration pneumonitis, pneumon any form of direct or indirect lung injury can actually give you B lines. So it's quite important to integrate the knowledge of the whole patient and the history in determining what the cause of your B lines and the cause of your lung infiltrates are. I hope that makes sense and answers that question, Johnny. Thank you, yes. Um, 
And so if you actually move around and look through the whole of the right lung, most of the right lung actually looks just like this. Um, and as we move down, so there's the right middle, right middle zone now, you can still see, so you're starting to see a little bit of liver here, and you can still see that the pleura is quite irregular. And over here, you might be able to see that something looks like, a, that someone take a little bite out of the pleura, just like this little indentation here. And that's called a small consolidation, or, or just a, it's just a little small consolidation of the pleura. There's been lots of debates about what those are. Um, we used to think that they were actually a little bit of plural consolidation. Um, however, there is some suggestion that they may actually be small pulmonary infarcts um, based on some um, contrast ultrasound work done at King's College Hospital. Um, either way, these are actually also hallmark of COVID-19 disease and they can actually, they're quite useful in diagnosing it. So if you see lots of subplural consolidation and lots of B lines in a patient, it's one of the things that you need to think about. And moving on, you can still see much the same on the right side. And as we get down to the right base, so here is the here is the right hemidiaphragm. Underneath is the underneath is the liver, and down here, so you can actually see that there's thoracic spine here. So this is quite a useful little sign. It's called the spine sign. You should normally not be able to see the thoracic spine ascend above the right hemidiaphragm. If you can, it usually means that there's something that allow that's allowing you to see through the normally aerated lung all the way through the back. In this case, what you can see here is lots of little white dots and some gray homogenous stuff, and this is all pulmonary consolidation. So even based on that chest x-ray, um, what he's got is lots and lots of B-lines anteriorly and then pulmonary consolidation at the base. And that's contrib contributing to his loss of aeration. The left lung was a lot more interesting. So looking at the left upper zone, already here, rather than seeing the B-line profile that you can see before, what you see here is this little irregular area here with dark stuff in it. And next to that, you can now, you can also see the irregular pleura on the B lines that we were seeing before. So I'll get you a better image of this as I look through the ribs. So as I look through, as I look down a little bit, this is more just very, very solid, dense B lines. But as I go back laterally over that particular nasty bit, you can actually see that it's actually a big wedge of very solid material and it almost looks like liver. So this is hepatized lung and this is a big consolidation. What we found in, our, in people who referred for ECMO at our institution is a lot of times they had, profound bilateral they had profound bilateral lung disease and they would often have at least one patch of consolidation like this. And a patch of consolidation like this off usually signified that they had a secondary infection. And we had quite a few people with secondary bacterial infections um, with severe COVID-19 disease. Um, ours were lots, we had lots of Klebsiella and Pseudomonas. I don't know if you saw anything similar in your cohort, Johnny. Well, I mean, yeah, obviously it's uh, industrial, uh, industrial secrets, but um, we did have a, uh, a fair few uh, Klebsiella pneumonias um, uh, in our makeshift intensive care unit, which was attributed to relatively um, uh, cramped intensive care conditions, which was our initial effort, uh, and some, inf um, some difficulties accepting that the PPE is to protect the individual, but you still need to put on um, gowns and gloves on top of PPE to protect the patients. Uh, and that was a lesson uh, learned through that. So, um, but yes, it's interesting to hear that Klebsiella pneumonia uh, was a feature in your hospital as well. Yeah, it certainly was. And um, we think that it was probably the reason why this, why this chat deteriorated quite significantly. And you can see more shots of this um, really big wedge of consolidation um, on the left-hand side. And as we get to the left base, that consolidation is still there. And right at the bottom of the left base with the, so this is the left hemidiaphragm now with the spleen there. You can still see quite significant loss of aeration. And so, um, so at BART, we actually do something called a lung ultrasound score where we score each quadrant. And so we normally scan six quadrants, um, six bits of each lung, giving a total 12 quadrants. And we score each quadrant of a scale of zero to three, where zero is well aerated lung and three is profoundly consolidated lung. So he had a starting lung ultrasound score of 31 and the high score you can get is 36. So he was pretty, pretty sick. And this also tallied with the fact that when we tried to mechanically ventilate him on our lung rest settings, he had tidal volumes between 50 and 100 mils. So this was a pretty sick man. Now, as you can imagine, um, with lungs like this, um, as you start to think in more advanced music terms, heart, the heart and the lungs work together as one unit. And so lots of things that affect the heart will affect the lungs. If you get left-sided disease, you get pulmonary edema and vice versa. If you get significant lung disease, you get 
pulmonary heart hypertension and you often get strain on the right heart. So it's quite normal for us to do both a lung scan and a heart scan when assessing these patients. And that's exactly what we did. So here we have another parasternal long axis view. Um, and this, um, again, so this is the same as, you can see this in FICE and both um, beyond FICE. So this just shows, um, if I can get the mouse up here, so this is the right ventricle here, it's the left ventricle here, it's the aortic root and left ventricle outflow tract and the left atrium. Now, it's a bit difficult to see on this scan, but with the eye of faith, um, some of you who are doing your FICE may have heard of the rule of thirds. So the left atrium, the aortic root, and the right ventricular outflow tract seen on a parasternal long axis scan should be roughly the same size. And on this scan, the right ventricular outflow tract is very slightly bigger, just there. When you're ever see, whenever you're seeing anything in echo, it's always worth thinking echo is a bit like orthopedics. You should always ask for an AP and a lateral, so you should always look for everything in more than one view. And moving on to the short axis view, you can actually see that there is a degree. So this is the left ventricle here, and this is the right ventricle here. And that interventricular septum does look a little bit flat. That suggests that that right ventricle is overloaded and causing a degree of pressure onto the left hand. So normally you'd be in FICE, you're taught to see you you're taught to look for this in particular um, when you're looking for people who've got massive right heart strain and people who've got massive pulmonary emboli. But in this case, you can also see this with people who've got significant pulmonary hypertension from from lung disease. And this is an apical four chamber view. So again, just a normal, same view that you'd see in your FICE, in your FICE scans. Um, on this view, the right ventricle doesn't look particularly enlarged. However, with the eye of faith, you can actually, if you look at the tricuspid annulus here, um, so the right ventricle works in two ways, longitudinally and radially, and looking at the longitudinal function of the right ventricle, it's probably slightly reduced. And when I formally measured it, it actually was reduced. When we have people on ECMO, this is one of the most important views that we look at. So this is a subcostal view looking at the IVC, just like the one you showed earlier. And in this case, what we're looking for here is the position of the ECMO cannula. So if you look very closely here, you can see this little, you can see some foreign material here, and there's a little pipe here. So there's a solid line there, and there's lots of dots at the end. This is the classical appearance of an ECMO return cannula. So this is the cannula that will shoot um, oxygenated blood back into the heart. And if you look back here, you can see a little solid line here. This is the classical appearance of an ECMO drainage cannula. So this is the cannula that's going to be draining the oxygenated blood from the IVC. So it's very important for us to look for the position of these cannulae, not just on x-ray, but also on echo, because you want to know what the distance is between them. They need to have a certain distance between them in order to minimize a mix of the, the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood actually just kind of mixing. So if your cannulae are too close together, the, um, the nice oxygenated blood comes out here and just gets sucked back. Um, you also want to make sure that the cannula are not too close to the septum so they don't make a hole in it. Um, and you also want to make sure that um, they're not obstructing the hepatic vein. So we actually also look at hepatic vein flows on, when we're doing advanced studies. So that was him, and that's how we got him all set up. Um, he was quite sick, as you can imagine, and so um, after a week, he actually continued to be hypoxic. And what we often do when people, are, when people remain hypoxic like that, uh, despite you try to turn up the amount of flow, blood flow that the, ECMO can, that the ECMO machine can give you. And if it's still not giving you high enough flow, you add in an extra cannula um, to give you even more flow. And in this case, we put in an extra jugular cannula, which would allow us to dial the flows up to even higher. Despite that, he was still actually quite difficult to oxygenate. So what we then did was we did, as I mentioned, we did a repeat echo. And we thought on repeat echo that the that the cannulae that he, so it's quite, it's often quite normal for cannulae to kind of migrate a little bit while people are in ICU. And on the repeat echo, it looked like his, uh, both his drainage and return cannula were too close together. So we pulled the return cannula back to give them a little bit more distance and he got better and was able to be oxygenated again. And this is just a second echo after the cannulae were pulled back just to show you a little bit about how his heart had progressed during that time. Again, this is parasternal long axis view. There's a slightly zoomed out one. One of the first things that you can see here is just um, posterior to the left heart, you can actually see that there's this big area of consolidation here. So this is actually his lungs. His lungs are still really badly consolidated and you can see that just from your echo. With the eye of faith, you could argue that the right heart looks a little bit smaller or more the same. But on short axis, 
that flattening of the septum seems to have re seems to have reduced now, and some of that is because the ECMO flow by draining blood from from the by draining blood from the IVC and by draining quite a lot of blood from the IVC, you can actually improve and decompress the right ventricle, which is what which is part of how ECMO works and how part of how ECMO improves people's outcomes. Actually. Now this is a non fice view. This is a slightly high peristernal short axis view, and this just shows the aortic valve here. The right, vent, right atrium here and shows the right ventricle curling round um, like, like a cross art, so, like, so we say, curling all the way around. And this shows you the pulmonary valve here and the pulmonary artery. Um, the pulmonary artery is about to branch just over here distally. This view is, the reason why I showed you this view is just to show you that one of the things that can still happen, even though he's nicely decompressed with his ECMO, is that the right ventricle is still not working very well. So normally a right ventricle works and it contracts in two directions. It contracts um, longitudinally, it contracts radially. And this is a good way to see radial contraction of the right ventricle. And even though his right ventricle looks like it's contracting longitudinally very well, the radial function is still quite down. And that's just a mark of how sick he is and how he's still got some way to go. It's an apical four chamber view that shows that his left ventricle is still working quite nicely. And again, if you look, his right ventricle longitudinal function, so looking at the tricuspid annulus here, that looks like it's working quite nicely. Um, so it'd be very easy to just look at this and think that the right ventricle is actually working really well. But it's a reminder that you need to, as we look after these quite complicated patients, um, your skills with echo will develop to the point where you can assess the right ventricle in multiple views and be able to make a call as to whether the right ventricle is working well or not. And here's a subcostal view. So this is a subcostal view with color. And what this shows here, so I don't know if you remember before, so the, the return of ECMO cannula was actually down here. So now it's actually been pulled back and it's actually now beyond the hepatic vein. And you can tell that's beyond here because you can see all this stuff jetting in. And this is actually the blood from the ECMO cannula that's being jetted in here. So this view is quite important here because one of the things that can happen when you pull your ECMO cannula back is you can block off this hepatic vein or we just wanted to make sure that there was still nice um, normal flow in it, which there was. And that helped him get better and he gradually started to improve. Um, we were able to grow lots more stuff um, from sputum and we started treating that. And as we got his antibiotics appropriate, he started to get better. And we're able to ventilate him now. So we decided to check his sound and see how he's improving. So I'll just speed through this very quickly because his lung option now looks a lot better from the time when, when we saw it initially. So this is his right lung. And what you can see, unlike before, where all you could see was these vertical beeline artifacts, they're still there. But underneath, you can now start to see there is the return of this horizontal line here, which mirrors the plural line. And that's an A line. These A lines, otherwise known as AOK -okay lines, these are normal lines that show normal lung aeration. And so his lungs are starting to re aerate. So there's another A line, there's another bit of A line coming in there. There's a few coming in here. And here as well. And as we go down to the right lung base, um, his right lung base is still quite heavily consolidated. And you can still see consolidation here. Now the left lung, which was a lung that was heavily consolidated before, now looks a whole lot better. And you can actually see that it's all quite well aerated now. As we come down to the, to the left lung base, you start to get a lot more, you start to get, you start to see a bit more consolidation, but overall it's still quite significant improved from earlier. And right at the bottom of the left lung, still heavily consolidated, but overall this is quite significantly improved. And his lung ultrasound score, which was 31 when he came in, was now down to the mid twenties. And that correlated with tidal volumes of about 200 and 300 mils now. So overall, he's actually getting a lot better. This is all stuff we're able to monitor at the bedside. So just a little bit about how we document our findings. So um, at BART, we were using a lung ultrasound form that looked like this, where we'd actually score each individual area with a number, talk about lung sliding, and we were actually issuing reports that, uh, that would go in our electronic patient notes so that we could actually keep track of, um, and keep track of each patient as we scan them. And this is just to show that we were actually we're also formally reporting our echoes and being able to do this as part of your advanced assessment of the patients is really important because these are assessments that should actually be recorded formally in the notes and be available for peer review and for quality assessment.
Um, unfortunately, our patient, um, despite the fact that he was doing well from lungs, um, um, developed um, fixed dilated pupils on day 16 and had this um, horrible bifrontal hemorrhage. Um, one of the other things that we sometimes do in our institution is um, another form of ultrasound called transcranial Doppler. Um, this is something that, that will be coming to a fusic module sometime within the year. Um, so this is actually, so this is actually a view through his right temporal, temporal bone. And this flash here is his middle cerebral artery. And this is pulled to the middle cerebral artery, showing blood flow through the middle cerebral artery. So this is um, this, so your middle cerebral artery um, waveform should normally have systolic and diastolic flow. And this waveform here shows that there's no diastolic flow. This is actually quite a bad sign and a sign of quite significant intricate raised intracranial pressure. And this is just a little diagram that comes from a lovely article written by Vincent Lau in 2017 that shows, shows what happens to normal MCA flow as intracranial pressure increases. And his was around here somewhere. So unfortunately, he um, eventually um, lost all reflexes and was diagnosed as um, was brainstem tested and um, treatment. Um, he was palliated and passed away. So overall, I just thought this was quite an interesting case I'd present, Johnny, because it shows how with really complex patients, you're using point of care ultrasound in multifaceted different ways from cannulation to monitoring to um, adjustment of, to just bedside adjustment of therapies um, and, you know, even to diagnosis and, you know, it, it, and making it um, a judgment as to whether to palliate patients or not. And these are all things that are coming to future fusing modules. There's going to be lots of advanced stuff that we'll be able to talk about a little bit towards the end. Yeah, great. Fantastic case. Um, uh, just like to apologize, my computer crashed. You can't plan for these things. Um, uh, and we've got a few questions, but so because we're running a bit short of time, shall I carry on with my presentation and we uh, uh, speak about the questions at the end? Would that be Yeah, I think so. Okay. If you, if I share my, um, stop, uh, stop my screen share and you switch over to your screen share. Yeah, except I think Matt, you're going to have to re-enable, um, me my ability to screen share thank you okay now uh i'm sorry again about that um i suppose these things happen but now i don't know if i'll give you a quick recap it's a young guy with septic shock who's had four liters of fluid whose obs are all terrible okay so right so there you're an a and e and um Second, huh. right. Uh, and now, can I ask you to try to get your phone out, scan this QR code, and vote as a group? What would you do? I'll give you a couple of minutes. It should be as simple as pointing your phone, your iPhone, at a QR code. I don't know about Android phones. Okay, let me have a look how you voted. Okay, oh, interesting. So quite a selection of responses uh, and more coming in. Um, so it looks like most of you have gone with option two, um, which uh, uh, that's fine. So let's just remind ourselves what option two is. Targeted fluid therapy using a cardiac output monitoring device. I think that's a reasonable thing um, to suggest. I mean, I suppose he's had four liters of fluid. It's made no difference. Now, you could argue that perhaps um, trying the same thing over and over again, using something, uh, uh, a little bit of a smarter device, isn't going to make the difference. And for me, at this stage, I would probably try and start a vasoconstrictor early because like I said before, the echo is consistent as is his pathology with a mixture between preload deficiency and an afterload problem. So a low afterload. And we've treated four liters of crystalloid in a short time is a treatment for the preload problem. We haven't really addressed the afterload problem. 
Now, you could argue that actually his microcirculation are all very leaky and all the fluid you're giving him is um, not staying within the circulation. Well, if that's an argument you're going to use, then you probably shouldn't give any more fluid. And actually giving a vasoconstrictor may recruit volume that is pulled within a um, very vasoplegic circulation. Okay, So in effect, a low-dose vasopressor therapy is like giving a fluid bolus, except in this case, the fluid is your own blood volume, which is less likely to, but not impossibly, uh, leak out of your um, gap junctions in your failing circulation. So, um, so after, um, so we started some low dose peripheral noradrenaline on this gentleman. We have a protocol for it, although it doesn't go down very well. Um, and um, his IVC, if you remember, was a slither and now looks a little bit more um, plump if that's a good word. Now, I just want to just get you to get the idea that vasoconstriction at low dose actually works in a number of ways, but probably the best way is actually a volume effect. So you do get an increase in cardiac output when you start your vasoconstrictor because you recruit volume that is pulled and therefore not contributing to pressure generation within your heart. It's pulled within your venous circulation and by by increasing venous tone, you are recruiting this volume into the heart and therefore it's like giving yourself a fluid bolus. But instead of crystalloid, which causes a very transient increase in cardiac output because it actually dissipates into the tissues and actually worsens tissue oxygenation, vasoconstrictor therapy is a much more sustainable therapy to achieve the same thing. Now, as you increase your vasoconstrictor therapy, it has less, less and less beneficial effects in the way we're describing and has a higher uh, effect on resistance, which increases afterload, and that can increase your uh, myocardial work and then result in um, an increase in, uh, in, its, uh, in, in its decompensation. So, uh, progress. So, you obviously had neck fash, if that wasn't obvious. You went to theatre and um, twice in 24 hours and had debridement, pretty extensive debridement. Lost a lot of blood, got a lot of blood products, and had a rocky kind of 48 hours and then stabilized to some degree. But then he became hypotensive again. His noradrenaline was pushed up to 0.8 and he had further fluid boluses, but was not responsive according to our cardiac output monitor. At this point, his fluid balance is 8.8 .8 liters since ITU admission, so excluding the four liters he had in a &E. And he had a worsening PF ratio and his compliance on the ventilator was getting worse as well. So all bad, really, I think we'd all agree. And actually, echo done at the time um, demonstrates this. So this is the same patient 40 hours later. And I think this is an important concept that when we get these really septic shock patients, the left ventricle looks hyperdynamic and we think, oh yeah, it's hyperdynamic. It's a preload, afterload problem, easy. Yeah, and that's probably true. But I actually think, and there's some evidence to suggest that um, actually the left ventricle becomes impaired because of metabolic or septic um, sequelae relatively early on the disease process, but the afterload is low. So this is hidden from macroscopic um, kind of inspection. So left ventricle looks hyperdynamic and we think that's fine. There's no problem with function, but actually if you correct the afterload or maybe overcorrect it and correct the preload, you unmask the fact that the ventricle was struggling from quite an early stage, but obviously 48 hours down the line, it's obviously, this is a stress stroke septic cardiomyopathy, pretty severe. You'd, you would report this as a severe left ventricular dysfunction on your FICE report. Uh, and this is a apical four chamber, which again um, reinforces that. This is now the pulmonary artery catheter, which has been inserted. And again, the IVC, which was a slither and then was a bit plumper, but still reactive is now no longer reactive in any way. Okay, camera's out again. So what are you gonna do? I, um, uh, it's not easy um, and I, the right answer according to your phone isn't necessarily the right answer, it's just my idea of the right answer. So give it some thought. The options are further volume expansion using your cardiac output monitor, insert a pulmonary artery catheter, which I've given away um, slightly sadly that we had done that. Doesn't necessarily mean it was the right thing to do. Start an inotrope and some steroids, give some beta blockers, or for, for ECMO, which sadly at St. George's we don't have.
great. And a lot of you are answering and you're getting, we are, are agreeing on the strategy, which is start some inotropy um, on the whole. Um, some people say go for ECMO straight away. I don't think that's an unreasonable thing. Um, so um, uh, apologies, option four obviously is not right. Um, but I think most people would say the next step is um, inotropy, which I would agree with. So, uh, and that's what we did. We used um, uh, actually echo and the pulmonary catheter to, to guide our inotropy. Um, and you can see here how over the course of increasing amounts of dibutamine, um, the ventricle started like this and looked slightly more impressive. And actually his hemodynamics improved, his SpO2 improved, stroke volume improved, cardiac output improved, and he started clearing his lactate. And two weeks later, he actually recovered. So no need for ECMO, um, although obviously he had a pretty stormy time. Um, and actually, I think, I'm not sure, but he required two further debridements. So I can imagine debridements plus ECMO is quite difficult, uh, especially when it comes to the anticoagulation aspect of it. Um, but um, as it was, we got through it. So I think overall, I want to say that this is actually quite a challenging case. So it's a young guy who came in with septic shock, which we think we know what it is, but actually septic shock is not one thing. It could be lots of different things contributing to the shock and teasing apart the different bits is actually quite challenging. Um, but using a technique which can be learned quite successfully in six months, but it's important to understand that your clinical judgment and your experience is key to integrating that with echo. So you can't just learn echo and be able to manage this patient. You've got to combine the two. But using the two, you have identified initial resuscitation strategies and worked out when something is no longer working to try something new. You've identified a quite a difficult to treat complication and figured out the best way to treat it. And you've demonstrated its effectiveness using echo, but also using the clinical picture. And you've monitored the recovery. So this is slightly beyond what we, what we say FICE is able to do, but it's not a massive leap to see how you can use relatively basic focus echo to, to do these things. So that's that. Now, I don't know if you want me to quickly go run through the advanced case, Shagan, would that be reasonable? Um, I think there's actually quite enough on both cases to just spend a little bit of time just actually discussing just different stuff. So there's quite a few questions that have come in already. Um, so one question, which we could probably dwell on. Oh, oh, by the way, that was an amazing case. Thanks, Johnny. That was fantastic. Um, one of the questions that we should actually um, just talk about was from Roshan. And it was just about clarifying the interpretation on TTE of preload versus afterload problems. Huh. And I thought that would take us quite a while to get through. So um, what are your thoughts? Uh, okay, so, so I think that's a very, that's a very difficult question, even for an advanced um, uh, mm -hmm. ECHO um, accredited person who understands a lot of cardiovascular physiology. And the result is one probably leads to the other. And, um, uh, and they are both intertwined to some regards. But Overall, I suppose there probably is a degree of, um, in a particular person, there may be a predominance of one over the other, uh, which would then lead you down one initial strategy before mm -hmm. the other. So, like I said before, overall, um, I think, first of all, is clinical history. So clinical history, a short illness would imply that they're not going to be significantly behind volume, okay? So in, in, in the case of this um, septic shock patient, he was well running 48 hours ago. So he's not like he's been not eating and drinking for a week, like the COVID population with very high insensible losses. So, so yes, there probably is a degree of hypovolemia and preload deficiency, but it, 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 and I would have thought, maybe I'm wrong, that four liters rapidly would have corrected at least some element of that. Mm and you'd start to see a response. So that's the clinical picture. Now we also have the clinical findings, which is a, a hyperdynamic um, peripheral circulation. So the capillary refill is very low and the lactate, even despite good peripheral perfusion is very raised. So that would, inc that would identify to me a vasoplegic state. Now looking at the echo, like I said, there's two things to eyeball. There's how big the heart is when it's full and how much the heart empties when it's emptying. Okay, so a, if your preload was adequate and optimized, the heart should fill up to a, a normal amount. So the end diastolic area, if you're thinking about the parasternal short axis, would be adequate. Now, 
unfortunately, we never very rarely have baseline echoes. So my, my um, end diastolic area under normality may be 12 centimeters squared. So when I come in and you scan me that I'm now six centimeters squared, that's clearly much, much lower. And I can say, well, actually, hang on a sec, six months ago, I was 12 centimeters squared. Now it's six centimeters squared. The, the heart's clearly not filling uh, at the end of diastole and therefore preload is a, obviously a, a major feature in this patient. We don't have that baseline scan. What we do know from studies that anything less than 10 centimeters squared, doesn't matter what kind of heart you have, is likely to be deficient on preload. So a very small end diastolic volume of less than 10 centimeters squared would indicate in most patients, doesn't matter about your comorbidities or not, that there is a preload problem. The heart is having trouble filling. And obviously there's a complex relationship between heart rate and filling, which I'm not even going to go into now. Now, like I said, so if, so if your heart is empty, when full, then the only way the heart can cope with to try and maintain cardiac output is to eject all of that volume. So your end diastolic area is small and your end systolic area is small. So your cavity completely obliterates. So both are small, which would imply for me, the initial strategy would be volume expansion. And I'd keep an eye to see if that's an effective strategy. Um, if on the other hand, the end diastolic area is normal and yet the cavity is obliterating during systole completely, then that would indicate to me less of a preload problem and maybe either an overt inotropy problem, like for instance, you might see if you gave a bolus of adrenaline or if you're hyperthyroid, um, or a low afterload problem, which is probably the most predominant clinical problem in sepsis. So even though it's an artificial distinction because they both exist together, you can tease out which is perhaps the most appropriate thing to intervene on first. Um, uh, yeah, I hope that makes sense. So that makes a lot of sense. Can I just share my little, my little cheat? Um, so I'm a very simple man. And so lots of these things, I try and simplify everything. So I combine heart history, echo, lung ultrasound and IVC to try and tell me whether it's preload or afterload, pro afterload problem. So if they've got a preload problem, they should have a tiny IVC, a hyperdynamic heart, and completely, completely dry lungs, and a compatible history, of course. If it's an afterload problem, after four liters of fluid, they should have a hyperdynamic heart, a full IVC, and wet lungs. There is only one caveat to this. There's one thing that doesn't fit in either of those, those and that's anaphylaxis, which will give you a hyperdynamic heart, wet lungs, and a small IVC. So that's my very simple cheat sheet way of looking at it. Yeah. Cool. We have one more um, question, or we had quite a few questions in the chat about, thought, about our thoughts on peripheral, um, starting peripheral noradrenaline. And um, <laughs> every institution is slightly different on that one. So I thought I'd get your thoughts. So um, do you ever do this? Um, what, um, what, do you, what are your thoughts on it? So um, we do do it. Um, there is a protocol for it, but it's not widely accepted. It's something that I'm very keen on doing. And I think um, there's plenty of studies now or, um, which would suggest it's safe. So um, as long as it's done appropriately, large cannula in the antecubital fossa with, with um, tissue obs, um, low dose dilute noradrenaline is safe. And I think it's something that can be practically started in uh, an ED. Now, I think probably as a group of intensivists who are listening, we'd all agree that noradrenaline should be started earlier. So what normally happens, someone comes in, they get filled to the brim with fluids, and then they get referred to ITU, an ITU review comes along, they spend a little bit of time deciding yes or no, maybe give some more fluid, and they say yes, we'll create a bed, they come up, and suddenly it's been six hours of hypotension, fluid maximization, which have then all dissipated into the tissues, worsening tissue oxygenation. So my feeling is we should be starting noradrenaline much earlier. And I think peripheral noradrenaline, low dose in the ED is a way of doing it. Something I'm trying to integrate and start now. Um, some people may argue that um, there's little pharmacological benefit over low dose um, noradrenaline versus metronamol or phenylephrine. I disagree. I think um, um, noradrenaline, low dose noradrenaline has 
effects like increasing a little bit of inotropy, like recruiting the pooled venous circulation. And phenylephrine is mainly an arterial vasoconstrictor. Uh, metronamol is mainly an arterial vasoconstrictor, which increases resistance first before venous tone. So I'm less keen. I don't like using metronamol at all. And I'd much prefer low dose noradrenaline in, in a protocolized fashion early on in these patients where um, venous, venous tone and preload are both both coexistent and therefore should be treated at the same time, not sequentially. I would, I would completely agree with you. Um, for people who don't work in institutions where that's possible, um, so some people are asking about dose. So I think one in 50 or two in 50 is probably about all right and is safe to give peripherally. But for people who don't work in institutions like that, um, one shortcut that you may try, you didn't hear it from me, is um, vasopressin or telepressin. Yeah. But again, as a bolus gives you a, a couple of hours to sort yourself out. Correct. But again, this is not something that you should, this is not cowboy stuff. You should talk to people in your institution about it. Um, try and draw up a protocol. If you're really worried about giving people, you know, about flooding people with fluids, then do this properly and think about the whole, think about it as a systems issue rather than just, I want to look cool in the ED when I'm down there and make my patient look awesome issue. Yeah. I mean, our, our protocol is four milligrams and 250 mils actually given via a volumetric pump and we only go up to 0 0.08 mics per kilo. So really dilute um, and, you know, quite low dose. Um, and that's what we've done before. Okay, that's really cool. And we are coming up to time actually. So, um, and um, that was really, really, that was a really, really amazing case that you presented, Johnny, and you broke it all down really, really well. And I think it's just a wonderful demonstration about how, even though everybody thinks FICE is very simple, um, it's not simple because you can actually tell huge amounts and make massive changes with your five, with, with, your, well, with your seven five views actually, including lung bases. And that can be enough to make the difference in some cases, literally between life and death. So please, you know, please everybody be encouraged. Um, please carry on doing FICE scans. And for those who are looking for stuff beyond FICE, the FUSIC committee have a whole bunch of really exciting stuff that we're still working on and still trying to work the kinks out of, but we are hoping to develop um, a syllabus of stuff going beyond FICE that will allow you to measure stroke volumes and pulmonary artery pressures and other things that will give you even more information to help you manage your critically unwell patients. Just having a quick look for Q through the Q&A, see if there's any other questions. Yeah, and last chance for anyone to ask any questions. Um... Nope, so far I think that's it. I answered quite a few questions. I'm um, just typing in the chat. Oh, there's a couple of extra questions that have just come in. All right. I can't see those. Oh, yes. Nope. Um, it was, I, think it was, I think it was just somebody saying thank you very much. Oh, yes. um, I was really happy. And that's very kind. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure to present these cases for you. And uh, apologies um, in advance. And uh, sorry I didn't get to show my second case, which will have blown your mind um, about how a little bit extra on top of FICE can really help you make some dramatic decisions that um, uh, would be absolutely impossible without. But maybe, maybe next time if I get invited. Absolutely. Back. Yes, definitely next time. And Johnny will definitely be invited back next time because he's been brilliant today. Thanks very much, everyone, for a lovely webinar. And hopefully, to, hopefully we'll get to see you again soon with our, there will be an ongoing series of FUSIC webinars. So um, I'll let you know that we'll send the dates of the next ones out through the Intensive Care Society. So look forward to hearing more stuff um, and learning how to sharpen your ultrasound game in critical care. Thanks very much, everyone. Good night. Good night.